Perfect. All yours. Wonderful. Um, and for those of you who have not attended a class with us before, uh, just as a reminder, uh, if you have any questions throughout the class tonight, uh, please feel free to drop them in the chat and we will get to as many as we can throughout the class. Awesome. Well, I'll think, hand things over to you, Tamara. Okay. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me. And tonight we're going to be making the Bernat Crochet Whaley Nice Basket. I keep wanting to call it Whaley Cute because I think it is Whaley Cute, but it's Whaley Nice. How adorable is this? It's really simple. As you can see, it's nice and stiff. And I'll tell you why that works in a minute here. But this would be perfect for any nursery or kids room or even just a really fun, you know, animal themed room in your house. Um, you can see it's got safety eyes on it right here. I'm going to try and hold it up real close to the camera. So it is safe even around the little ones. And then that smile is just embroidered on at the end. So like I say, it's a pretty simple pattern. Probably the hardest part is the tail. So that's what we're going to actually be tackling first. But to make it, we're going to be using Bernat Baby Blanket, which you can see right here. And Ber Bernat Baby Blanket is the baby version of Bernat Blanket. And what makes it the baby version, it is that it's Okotex certified. So we know it's totally safe and free of any of the chemicals or anything that might hurt baby at all. So you can, of course, use Bernat Baby Blanket. But if there is a different color of Bernat Blanket that you love, you can absolutely use that to make your Whaley Nice Basket as well. Whatever color you want to use is fine. I do want to point out that we're going to be working with this yarn double stranded. I only have one ball to demo with today, so I'm going to be pulling from both ends of the ball. But I really strongly suggest when you make this pattern that you use two balls at the same time and just pull from when one end of each of those balls. It's just a lot easier. So let's go ahead and go to the hand camera here. And I want to talk just a moment about the hooks. Now, like I said, we're going to be working with these yarns held doubled. So we need to use a hook that's going to be comfortable for that. And which hook is going to be easiest for you to use with that yarn held double is totally up to you. Each person is going to hold their hook and manage their yarn a little bit differently. So don't be afraid, though, to switch up your hook style if need be as you go. To make this pattern, we'll be using a USL 8 millimeter hook. In addition to the hook and yarn, of course, you're going to need some stitch markers for this and those safety eyes I was talking about. And I just wanted to show everybody really quick, if you haven't seen safety eyes before, just how they work. You can see here, I've got a lot of different sizes, but essentially it's the eye portion with a little post on the back there. And when you stick that through your crochet fabric and add this backing and slide it on, it gets totally stuck there. So it's not coming back off. And this is what makes items like this safe to be around smaller children. So safety eyes are something you could use, or if you're just gonna use it as a decorative basket and you don't think it'll be around the kids, you can feel free to use a button or whatever you'd like. So I'm going to go ahead and slip the yarn label off my yarn here. Now that we can pull up our ends, I've got the middle that I pulled out a little bit of already. You can see here and kind of made a little ball of it. And I'll set that and the rest of the skein off to the side so I can get both of my ends together. Like I said, if you're making the full size basket, I really strongly recommend that you pull from two different skeins. Um, if you didn't want to work with yarn held doubled for this pattern, you could absolutely just do it with one strand. You would just want to use a smaller hook and then you'd end up with a slightly smaller basket, but that's a lot of fun too. So before I start get started with the actual pattern, were there any questions right off the bat, Allie, that I could answer? I don't see any here. Okay, awesome. Just wanted to make sure. I just wanted to get right into it. So like I say, we've got the written instructions here and officially they would start with the basket and then you go to the tail, but the tail is sewn on at the end. So we're going to go ahead and start there because it's got the most shaping. So I want to make sure we go over it first. So like I say, we've got our two strands of yarn held together. And what we want to do is just kind of match those up as best we can. We're going to weave those in at the end and then come in a good six inches or so. Sorry about that. And we will go ahead and put a slip knot in our hook. Now, if you haven't worked with two different strands of yarn at the same time, we basically treat them as if they're one. So just pretend, you know, as if your yarn was splitting a little bit, if you have trouble, just want to try go ahead and work them together. Sometimes they might naturally twist up together like this. Um, if they do, that's not a problem. Keep crocheting. If they don't, if they want to stay separate like this, that's fine too. You can just go ahead and keep crocheting. Don't worry about that at all. So to begin our tail, after we put our slip knot on the hook, we're going to chain eight. So this is what I was talking about. We're working with two strands of yarn here. So fitting them in that the throat of the hook right there can be a little tricky. 
So you want to go ahead and take your time and really pull those through. And like I say, maybe try a different hook style if you're having a little bit of trouble. So we're just going to take our time and make these chains. When we're working with a big fuzzy yarn like this, it helps to give a little extra yank on each chain as you make it. Because the yarn is so fuzzy, it wants to cling to itself rather than uh, letting, letting the yarn slide through. And you'll have to stop and pull more yarn off your skein pretty regularly. Like I said, with this stuff, big thick stuff like this always does go quickly. So let's see how many chains we've got here. It's always hard to count and chat at the same time. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we've got one more to make. I'll pull up a little bit more yarn here off the ball. And now we've got eight chains made. So to begin row one, what we're going to do is we are going to skip the chain closest to the hook. And this is a little different than what the instructions say. They have you chaining one rather than skipping one, but this is a small error in the pattern. We're going to skip that chain that's closest to our hook and work into the chain after that. Now, you may be most used to working under those top two loops of the chain, but I'm going to recommend that you flip it over and work under the bottom hump. It's just a little bit easier when you're working with yarn held doubled, I find, to pick out that back hump. But, uh, you know, you can work under the top two loops if you prefer. So again, uh, we chained eight, we skipped the chain closest to the hook, and we're gonna single crochet in each chain across. The reason I know that there was a small error there is because I know at the end of this row, we're supposed to have seven single crochets. And that's, so that's what we need to do to get seven single crochets. So I've skipped one there. So there's one single crochet. And keep in mind too, if this is two strands of yarn held together as instructed in the pattern. So there's two. And just go ahead and make your single crochets all the way across. Like I say, it's a little tricky when you're working with two. You just need to take your time and uh, make sure you grab both of those loops for the chain. And that's why I like working into the back of it is because then I'm just looking for those two strands to get under. And if this happens and you pull through and you find you just have one, then you just need to pull that stitch right back out and do it again. Just part of crocheting. So at the end of row one, you should have a total of seven single crochets. This is my fourth one here. And I'm struggling a little bit to get my hook in that stitch. So I'm gonna go ahead and try my other hook and see if that helps a little bit. There we are. Like I say, it's just uh, each individual is gonna crochet a little differently. So feel free to experiment and find what works best for you. And again, if you are just really struggling, Using two strands, you can absolutely make this pattern with one. Just use a slightly smaller hook and uh, you'll have a slightly smaller basket. All righty, so we should have a total. <laughs> Let's see here. There we go. We should have a total of seven single crochets. There we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So those are the seven single crochets for row one. To begin row two, we're going to chain one and turn or turn and chain one, however you like to do it. And we want to put two single crochets right into that very first stitch. So there is one and there is two. Get that pulled up and through, there we go. Then we are going to single crochet in each of the next five stitches. So one, two, three, make your time lift up that loop if you need to there, four, get some more yarn up here, really just have to kind of keep pulling it out of the skein, I'm going to run through it pretty quickly, and then five, Oh yes, and sorry for anybody who coming in late, I am starting with the tail because that's the most, most complicated, most shaped part. And then we'll come back to the body because it's a little simpler and it's kind of the same thing over and over again. So after we've made those five single crochets, we've got one stitch left there from row one. And so in that last stitch, we're going to go ahead and put two single crochets. We had two single crochets in the first stitch, then a single crochet in each of the next five, 
been to in the last. There we are. So then at the end of row two, you should have a total of nine stitches and it should slightly stick out a little bit. Now, um, again, a, if you want to use one strand of the size six yarn, I think a six millimeter hook would be a great choice. As long as you can pull those loops through and you're not struggling too much, then it sounds like a good pair that should make a nice stiff fabric. All right, so then we've got row three. We're going to start again with a chain one and turn or turn and chain one. And then we just single crochet across single crochet in each stitch across. So as you can see, the tail itself isn't complicated or difficult, but it is slightly different than the rest of the uh, basket. And I just want to make sure we could get through this whole tail together. When you look at the size of this basket, and you know it takes four skeins of yarn. You know we're not going to get through the whole basket in one hour, but we should be able to get through the trickiest bits, and I should be able to demonstrate all those stitches. With big stitches like this, you really kind of have to manhandle the yarn a little bit. A lot of people find it easier when they're crocheting a little more stiffly like this to hold the hook um, in a knife style. If you find that you kind of, if you normally hold it pencil style, and if you switch to this handle, hand holding style, it might be a little easier for you too. Everybody's different. Not one, there's not one that's right or wrong. It's just whatever works for you. I just need to pull up my yarn a little bit here. When you're working with two strands together, it's real easy to accidentally get tangles. That's why I recommend if you can that you work from two separate skeins. Um, and then even I sometimes will put one skein on each side of me so that they're really kind of held far apart. That seems to help a little bit as well. So we've got just a couple more stitches to make here now that I've got some more yarn pulled up. And that should be it for row three. We can always check our count. It's always a good idea. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So now we're done with row three. So row four is going to be the same as row two. We're going to chain one. And again, I need to give that a little tug there. Didn't want to pull up and through. But we're going to do two chain, uh, excuse me, two single crochets in the first stitch. And then single a crochet across till we get to the last stitch and then put two single crochets right in that very last stitch. So I need to pull up some more yarn again. Here, let me get that straightened out a little bit. You'll notice I'm using a slightly different color in the, in the pattern. I think it called for a sea foam, and this one is the baby teal. I really like this one. It's so pretty and blue, but like I say, that's the fun of crocheting, right? We get to make everything whatever colors we want. Oop. Make sure you get both those strands there. Just take your time and really don't, you know, don't be afraid of the yarn. Go ahead and give it a tug. This is some strong stuff. It's not going to fall apart on you. You can really manipulate it and pull it around into those stitches. We're trying to create, and the reason we're working with a double stranded is we really want to make a nice uh, thick stiff fabric. When you're, whenever you're making a basket or pieces like this, you really want them to kind of have a stand up on their own and crochet is so good for this. This is definitely, I'd say an advantage crochet has over so many other crafts. We can make things that are loose and drapey and beautiful sweaters and scarves. And then we can do things like this and make things that are really stiff and a little more exciting and have pieces and are a little bit more fun. So let's see, it looks like we've come to our last stitch here. So we wanna remember to put two single crochets in that last stitch. So there's one. And two, there we are. And that's what it should look like then at the end of row four of the tail. You can see we've got that great tail shape going there, a little wider than it was at the base. And now we're ready for row five, which is just another row of single crochets. We're going to run into that a lot in this pattern when you are making the body of the whale, I guess, the, the actual basket portion, you're going to, um, have sort of like rows of worked even in between the increases and then at the decreases at the top. And this just creates a really a more gentle slope to the curves along the side of the basket. So if you wanted to play with this pattern a little bit, you could certainly play with those increases, especially for making it in a different size or with a slightly different yarn. Fortunately, my yarn back here has gotten a little tangled. I apologize because I'm having to pull from both ends of one skein. So I just need to sort that out for a moment happens all the time no matter how much you crochet 
So while I'm doing that, Allison, were there any questions I could answer while I get my yarn sorted out a little bit back here? Um, so Jean wants to know if there are any um, yarn substitutions outside of Burnett Blanket. Um, well, gosh, I mean, you really could, I suppose, use any yarn you wanted. Um, I'm always a big fan of like, for instance, Red Heart with Love because it is so washable and kid friendly and it also comes in a ton of sizes. Um, you know, you could go down, there's, for instance, I think it would be so fun if somebody used something like Red Heart, it's a wrap rainbow or something like that, make teeny tiny little um, whale baskets. Um, if you want to substitute and get about the same size, then you're going to want to look for another uh, six or jumbo weight yarn. Uh, but if you want, if you're okay with different sizes of baskets, you can absolutely have some fun mixing it up, trying different textures and colors and ombres. Uh, Red Heart has some really gorgeous Super Saver ombres that might be a lot of fun. Um, and then, of course, when you're holding two strands together, you can mix up your own color. So you can do all kinds of things. Um, you know, something like this where it doesn't have to fit. You can really have some fun with the yarn and just see what you come up with. You know, at the end of the day, you're still going to have a basket. So, all right, I think I've got enough yarn here. We can get our fifth row made. So we're just gonna single crochet on across. Were there any other questions here since we're just single crocheting? Let's see. I believe we already touched on this, um, but a size six yarn with the six millimeter hook if you're whole, if you're only have got have, have one strand, I think if you were trying to double strand it with a six millimeter hook, you'd be having a bit of a struggle. Um, you know, if, if you if you aren't struggling, that's awesome. Um, I think that would be a very, very stiff fabric indeed. Um, but you know, that's that's just it too. This is the way that this particular number six works up. Um, a different number six with a different construction might not be as stiff. So that is, of course, the small gamble you take too. When you change up the yarns, they are going to react differently as well. So let's see here. There we are. We are at the end of row five. So then we are ready for row six, which should be the last row of our tail here. What we're going to do is we are going to start with a chain four. Just need a little bit more yarn to get through this row here. <laughs> Straightened out here. We're gonna start with a chain four, and this is gonna count as a treble crochet. So this is sort of the stand, um, and it is a typo, I believe, jumping from row five to row nine. This should be row six. We'll pretend they were upside down when they wrote that one. Um, so we'll try with a chain four here, two, three, four. And I wanna point out that this chain four is going to be count as a treble crochet, so we don't have to work back into these chains. So as before, if you'll recall, when I was chaining, I was really kind of giving each of those chains a little yank to make sure we could get back in there with our hook. We don't have to do this for this one. This is just going to be a treble crochet. So you can feel free to just go ahead and work those four chains off. In fact, I think it's a little, a little more accurate to the size of a treble if you don't try and make those a little bit bigger for working back into. <coughs> Excuse me. So after we've made our treble, we can turn. And then we are going to work a treble crochet in the next stitch. So that means that first stitch is considered worked because this is considered the treble crochet that is worked into that stitch. So to make a treble crochet, an actual treble crochet, we'll yarn over twice, insert our hook in the next stitch. So remember that's the stitch we're skipping right there. We come to the next one, insert that hook. And you can see already I've changed the grip on my hook. It's just a little bit easier sometimes with these stitches. Then we yarn over and pull that through. Make sure you've got both of those loops on there. Get some more yarn ready to go here. These are some tall stitches. They're gonna use the yarn really quickly. So we want to sort of stretch that out and get our yarns paired up a little bit before we finish the stitch. There we are. Then we yarn over and pull through two. Yarn over and pull through two and yarn over and pull through two. There we are. So we want that to be, like I say, about the same height as that treble. So if you find that that treble is just a little too loose or crazy, then um, you can make those stitches a little shorter. I also wanna show you a little trick that I have for treble crochets that you can do instead of the chain four. 
that I think might give a really nice edge for this. So what I'm going to go ahead and do, and this is a little bit more advanced of a skill, but it's one you might want to give a try. Okay, so instead of making the chain four, the option would be to do a chainless starting treble crochet. And to do that, I'm going to go ahead and turn my work, even though I haven't chained yet, and I'm going to pull that loop up to about the height that the treble crochet was. We just made one, so we've got an eyeball, eyeball view. It was about this tall. Then I'm going to pull it up just a hair taller. I'm going to secure the top of that loop with my finger, wind the loop itself around the hook, go on into that first stitch, yarn over, pull those loops up and through, and I'm still holding on to the top of that stitch with my finger there, that loop. Yarn over. Actually, you know what? I screwed that up because we needed to yarn over twice. It's a treble. I apologize. That was a, that was a chainless double crochet. Let me try that again. Pull it up to the height of a treble. Yarn, well, secure that yarn loop with your finger. You now yarn over twice. Treble crochet. I'm so used to doing doubles. There we go. Go into that first stitch. Yarn over. Pull up our loop. And now we can yarn over and pull through two, three times. So there's one, two, and then for that last one, you can finally release that loop and three. So this looks to me a little bit more like a standard treble than a chain four does. But again, your personal preference is what matters here. So you can use whichever version you like. If you'd like to see that again, I do have um, video tutorials on those stitches on my YouTube channel but let's go ahead and continue with the rest of the pattern. So like I say, to begin the rest of that row, we're going to have a treble crochet in the next stitch. Oops, keep forgetting to yarn over twice, those darn trebles, there we go. Get in there and make our treble crochet. And it looks like I dropped one of those loops, so we're just gonna go ahead and pull that right back out and do it again. Luckily, the vast majority of this pattern is single crochets. There's just these few trebles here on the last row of the tail to give us that shaping. There we go. Oop. Grab that one and get it through the loop. Let's see, get those loops back on the hook so I don't lose it. Go. There, sorry about that. Like I say, sometimes those loops just want to fall off when you're working with two strands at once. And you just have to take your time, sort of straighten them out. Okay, treble crochet is made. Now we're going to double crochet in the next stitch. My fingers really wanted to double crochet there. Then half double crochet in the stitch after that. So that one's yarn over, go in, pull up your loop yarn over and pull through all the loops on the hook. Just take your time and really pull that through there. It can help really too to push that, or rather point that hook down towards your work as you pull through if you're having a little bit of a struggle there. Then we are going to single crochet in the next stitch. There we are. Slip stitch in the stitch after that. We're not going to be working back into that slip stitch, so you don't have to make it loose or anything. Just go ahead and pull it right on through. And then we start building our way back up the other side. So now we're creating that shaping at the end of the tail. So now we do it in reverse. Single crochet, followed by half double crochet, followed by double crochet, And then finally, a treble crochet in each of the last two stitches. So yarn over twice, I always forget that second yarn over, and go ahead and work those stitches right off. So we've got one more stitch here. And as soon as we've got this last stitch made here for the tail, we are done with the tail itself. And we're just gonna go ahead and set this aside and then get started on the body. But now you can see what the tail should look like there when it's fresh off the hook. So let me grab my scissors here and cut a good tail end here. I always like to leave at least six inches to weave in those ends. And when you've got something like this, where um, it's, you know, sort of this large amigurumi sort of style, 
Rather than pulling that yarn end through to finish off and secure that last loop like you might normally do, I really like to just go ahead and pull straight up on it. And it's not quite as secure yet, but when you take your yarn uh, needle and weave in those ends, it's gonna be nice and secure. And it's just gonna look a little bit smoother there without that knot tied into it. So that is my recommendation for that. Now, like I say, go ahead and set this tail aside and then we will be, get started, be getting started rather on the body portion that you can see right up here. So I'm just going to grab my yarn ends here and cut off the part that's got a big tangle on it so we can continue. There we go. Okay, so now we're gonna come back and I wanna talk a little bit about the pattern for the actual body of the basket itself. Now, again, this is worked with two strands of yarn held together throughout. And then as you begin the pattern to work in the rounds here, trying to get it centered here on our screen, you're going to be working in regular rounds where you join with a slip stitch. And then when you begin the next row, you'll chain one, you know, our little turning chain there and begin the next round. When we get down to the sixth round, right down here, uh, that's where things are gonna change. The previous rounds, we've always been working under the both loops like we normally do for a single crochet. In the sixth round, we're gonna be working in the back loop only, and we're not going to join at the end. At the end of this round, we are going to start working in spirals. So that's where our stitch markers are gonna come in super duper handy. You really wanna have stitch markers when you're working in spirals because otherwise it is super, super, super easy to lose your place and end up just completely in the wrong place um, when you're working in a spiral because it's very difficult. When we've got the turning chain, you can see where you began. And when you're in a spiral, that of course goes away. So to start this portion, we're gonna start working in the round. If you are an experienced crocheter and you'd prefer to use something like the magic circle, you can do that. But I'm going to go ahead and follow the instructions here where we begin with a slip knot. And for beginner crocheters, the slip knot instructions aren't usually included. It's sort of, I liken it to sort of like putting on your apron when you're starting to cook. There's sort of assumed, I guess, in a way uh, in the recipe that you're going to go ahead and put that slip knot in there. So unless it says specifically to start with the magic circle or some other way, generally you're starting with a slip knot. After that, we're going to chain two. So chain two, one and two, oops, dropped a loop there. So we redo that second one. There we go. And then we're going to work 10 single crochets in the second chain from the hook. So that's that very first chain we made. And when we work that many stitches into one chain, it's going to mean we're essentially working all the way around that chain. We're gonna come back around and meet it, our first stitch here. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring up my stitch markers. So I've got these ready ready to go there. And then I'm going to go ahead and start crocheting. And again, I'm going to go under that back hump of that the first chain there, but you can go under those top two loops if you prefer, or just under one of, uh, one of the loops, just make sure you're getting both strands of yarn. So this is my first single crochet. There we are. So I'm going to go ahead and put a stitch marker in it. Even though we're not working in a spiral yet, I just love using stitch markers to help me keep my place, especially when I'm working in the round. It's just a really good habit to get into. I want to make sure to pull up those loops again so we can get into them for our next stitches. And then we just go right back in that same stitch for nine more single, single crochets. So there's two and three. And you can see how it's already creating a circle there as I keep working into that stitch. So as we keep working, we're going to end up kind of crocheting right over those tails a little bit, and that's totally fine. It's okay too to sort of give that work a yank, pull on it a little bit if needed to help you get your hook right back in there. So this is an easy place for things to start getting really tight. Make sure that you always give a big yank up on that loop like that. Uh, these stitch markers are by Clover and uh, Clover USA, and they are available in most major craft stores, I believe. So let's see here, we've got, this is why I like to have that stitch marker in there with the turning chains. Uh, when you're working around like this, it's very easy to lose your place. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. And I've got five more to fit in here. So like I say, you really kind of have to take your time and squeeze them in and make sure that you're lifting up on that last loop or these stitches 
can start getting very, very tight indeed. And then you'll have a little bit more of a baskety shape than you intended. Starting out here on our basket, we're starting at the bottom of the basket, of course, where it's closed. And so uh, we're gonna be working in basically flat circles for a little while. So this is, as you can see, getting very, very tight. I'm really having to squeeze those stitches in there. Let me pull up a little bit more yarn here and count our stitches again. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We've got to fit two more in there. So go right on in there. This too is where it's really handy to have that stitch marker. So I know I don't accidentally work over that stitch and lose it all together. So there's nine. Pull that open just a little bit more there. Squeeze in this last stitch. And there's 10. All right. Okay. We got our 10 single crochets all worked in there. Like I say, if you're a more experienced crocheter and you want to use a different start for your mat, like a magic circle, that is totally fine. But we'll get our stitch marker right there in that last stitch. Um, and since I saw we do have a few beginners in here, stitch markers like this, um, not necessarily this brand, they don't have to have this particular shape, but the kind that open are the kind you do want to use for crochet. If you're a knitter, you may be familiar with the stitch markers that are a closed circle. Those unfortunately do not work for crochet. Um, they would get stuck in your project forever, basically. So, all righty, we've got all the way around for our first round and we want to join with a slip stitch. So again, this is where it's really handy to have that stitch marker so we can use it to help us find the top of that stitch so we can get in there. There we go. And make our slip stitch to join. And again, this is another point, uh, place I can point out why it's really helpful to have those stitch markers is because when we're joining, it's really easy to accidentally count that slip stitch as one of your stitches, and that doesn't count. So we wanna make sure to know that this is the last one and this is the first one. So after you've got your first round made, then it's time for round two. Allison, did we have any questions on that one while I take a little sip of my water here? Oops. Allison, did we lose um, you? Oh, <laughs> okay. I'm oh. just double checking. Okay. I think we're all set. Okay, awesome. All right, we shall continue on a round for round two then. Round two, uh, again, like I say, we're working sort of in standard flat circles at this point. So we're just going to chain one for our turning chain and then work two single crochets in each single crochet around. So again, we've got that stitch marker to help us find that first stitch. So we'll go right in that same stitch there for one stitch. And then right away, I'm going to go ahead and move that stitch marker on up because now this is the first stitch of the current round. There we are. Then we need to get a second stitch right in that same stitch. And these are increases. So by putting two single crochets in each of the single crochets from the row before, Whereas in row one or round one, rather, we had 10 in round two, we will have 20. So like I say, just make sure, and I, I clearly can't emphasize it enough. Um, I've worked with this yarn a fair bit and you really do have to kind of give a little extra lift to those loops as you pull them up and through. Otherwise it just tends to become super duper tight on you. So it is a lovely yarn and it uh, is very easy care. Like I say, this the baby blanket in particular is Ocotec certified. So it's a great choice. We just need to take a little bit more time with it when we crochet with it to make sure that we can keep making those beautiful even stitches. So I'll continue to single crochet around here, two single crochets in each single crochet. And right now we are working under both of those top two loops, which in our case, since it's double stranded is actually four pieces of yarn. But just to kind of hold it up right here, you can see we've got both of those two loops at the top. We're going with our under both of those with our hook as we're making these single crochets. These are standard single crochets. These are the kind of single crochet you make in a pattern when it calls for a single crochet, unless otherwise specified. Now, until when we get to round six, that's when it is otherwise specified. That's why I was talking a little bit about that back loop only. 
And it's really common for beginner crocheters to not realize that they're supposed to be going under both of those loops and to only be going under one of them when they're getting started. Um, I'll tell you, that actually is something that happened to me uh, when I first learned how to crochet. I got real ambitious and decided to make myself a single crochet through the back loop only queen sized blanket. And I will tell you what, it weighed about 50 pounds before I got three feet into it because that is a very small stitch. So something to keep in mind if you are a new crocheter. Just work under both of those loops unless otherwise specified. So, all right, we can see here we've come around. We've got that last stitch. So work two more in there. So there's one and two. And then as soon as we've worked that last stitch, I will go ahead and move that last stitch marker up to the new last stitch. And you can see that's really handy because it would be very easy to mistake that little slip stitch right there for a stitch if I didn't if I didn't have uh, these other two marked. So then of course we can slip stitch and we are ready for round three. But that's what it should look like after round two. Still nice and flat. If you find that it's trying to cup up a lot like this or the other way, doesn't really matter, it's the same thing. What it is is you're not pulling up on those loops and that top V of each stitch is becoming a little too short. So that's, that's why I really wanted to emphasize pulling up on those loops as you crochet. So now we're ready for round three. Again, sort of standard crochet increases. We're going to start with our chain one. And then now we're going to work two single crochets in the next stitch and one single crochet in the next stitch. So that means two, then one, two, then one, two, then one, all the way around. So we're increasing only in every other stitch. So in the first round, we had 10 stitches. And in the second round, we had 20 stitches. And in this third round, we're going to have 30 stitches. When you increase by the same number in each round like that, that's how you get a flat circle. So basically, we're just going to be spreading out those increases with more and more stitches in between them. This is our increase right here, two stitches in the same stitch. And that is how we keep increasing in a flat circle. That is the general mathematical principle for crocheting flat circles. And flat circles are great. They're, as you can see here, how you start the bottom of a basket. They are often how you start the top of a hat. You work in a flat circle till you have the size of the head and then work down the sides. So it is a really great uh, mathematical sort of formula to learn and hold in your head. So just to talk through a little bit about what I've been doing here, a little bit more yarn. We now have, you can see here, we've got, oop, that one didn't pop open on me there. We've got two single crochets in the first one, one in the one after that. Two single crochets in the next one, one in the one after that. And that is our pattern for round three. So any questions I can answer about round three, Allison? I feel bad they're just watching me single crochet. <laughs> No questions at the moment. Okay. Um, there are, there have been, some, I guess, a couple comments about some people mentioning they're seeing some errors in the PDF. Okay. I can't, um, I can't attest to those at the moment, but certainly if there are any error, any additional errors outside of the tail chains, um, we'll work to get those updated as well. Absolutely. All righty. Just had to check there and see where I was at. I was so busy listening to Allison. I forgot to <laughs> do my own stitching. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like I say, there was that. And I know we jumped from uh, row five to row nine in the pattern for the tail, but that was uh, just a wrong, wrong keyboard press. It happens to all of us, I'm sure. Um, um, Carol said her hands get so sore. Do you have any hints for keeping your fingers loose? Um, you know what, when you're working, I normally do, but when you're working with really tight fabric like this, that is unfortunately just part of it because you really kind of have to keep all that tension in your hands for it. Um, my best advice is to take breaks. Um, anytime I'm working a big, heavy, bulky project like this, um, I would never make this basket, you know, in one sitting all the way through. 
Um, first of all, like I say, it was going to take well over an hour to make, but you just really do need to give your hands breaks. So go ahead and put it down every once in a while, stretch your fingers, stretch your arms, and really make sure that you're stretching out, um, you know, your forearms. It's kind of hard to do here on this little hand cam, but all the way up to the shoulders as much as possible. Um, just take lots of breaks and do lots of stretching. I would also, now I've got to see where I'm at here. I would also recommend that you do think about keeping your shoulders down. Um, I think a lot of us as we crochet, and even just as we go about our days, our shoulders can really work up into our ears basically over the course of the day. And that can be reflected in our crocheting. Right now we're trying to work tight, but we don't always want to work tight. So really just taking the time to relax and bring your shoulders down, that should help quite a bit as well. But yeah, when you're working tight like this with thick yarn, sometimes you just do have to take breaks. So I've got two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. One, two. Okay, just making sure we're in the right spot here. So like I say, we're just crocheting our flat circle here. Um, if you guys have any other questions like that, I can address here as I'm just sort of single crocheting around in a circle, I'd be happy to do so. But I do wanna thank you for joining us today. All right, pull up some more of this yarn. And, you know, if you are working with a Bernat blanket, let us know what color you're using today. Like I say, the pattern called for sea foam. I'm using baby teal because, you know, got to mix it up. But let me know what you guys are using. And I suspect I lost count here, to be perfectly honest, on my round. So let me count and see where we're at. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and put one stitch in that last stitch there. There we are. So now we should have 30 stitches. And since we've got some more beginners in here, I want to go ahead and point out how you can count those rounds. If you look closely at what I've got right here, you can sort of see the concentric circles. There's one here and then one here and then one here. And each of those are around. And I always kind of look for the little valleys, the little dips in between the rounds here. If I hold it sideways, maybe, I don't know if that's easier to see in person maybe than on camera, but if you've got something in front of you, if you're practicing your crochet, look for those little dips and valleys and really pay attention as you work those rounds and uh, you'll st start being able to read your work a little bit better. So that, like I say, is what it should look like here at the end, although we need to move that stitch marker up and join with our slip stitch and then we'll be ready for round four. Uh, now rounds four and five are pretty much more of the same. Let me go ahead and pull that up here. Rounds, uh, like, let's see here, rounds four and five, we are going to, for round four, we single crochet in the next stitch, uh, then two in the stitch after that, then one in the one after that. This can be really confusing for a lot of people um, so let's go ahead and work it together because what they've done here is they've essentially moved the increase so that it doesn't start creating a pointed circle. We have to move the location of those increases a little bit so that the circle shape itself stays smooth. And sometimes that means the location of the increase inside the stitch repeat moves around a little bit. So for the to begin round one, we're going to start with a single crochet in the first stitch. So we'll go ahead and get that in there. Oops, getting caught on the stitch marker. If you need to, you can always take that stitch marker out ahead of time once you know where that stitch is going to go. There we go. Get that back in there. And then we work two single crochets in the next stitch. So there's that increase. One and two. And then we single crochet in the next stitch. And then we start the repeat over again. So what I want you to notice is that our repeat is one single crochet, two single crochets, one single crochet. So that's the set of basically it's four stitches worked over three stitches that we need to repeat. We've made four stitches, one, two, three, four, working into three stitches. So don't end up skipping one of these one single crochets. So it's going to look like you make two in a row. So we go one, two, one. One, two, one, one, two, one, all the way around. 
like I say, when they when you have to split the repeat like this, it's very easy to miss one of those stitches at the end of the increase and not realize that that's supposed to be in there. And then you'll end up with too many increases and then you will start getting a bowl shape before you're meant to, because right now we're still working flat. So I hope that made sense. If not, please do leave a comment. If you'd like me to try and explain that again. Um, but basically, yeah, that's just to keep this really great round shape. If you let all your increases sort of line up, like you always do them in the first stitch of a round, then that's when you start getting, um, that's when you start getting uh, more of a pointed shape, more like a hexagon or an octagon or however many increases you're making. I guess this would be a, oh gosh, what's 10? I know it's deca something. You guys will have to leave a comment and let me know. I'm terrible at those. Decahedron maybe? That sounds fancy, but that's probably not it. So we'll just keep increasing on around here. And then, so when we get to round six, or excuse me, round five, because this is round four, Round five is again, more of the same at this, that point, we can move the increase back to the beginning of the row because we've taken care of any points in this row. But then at that point, you've got two single crochets in the first stitch and then a single crochet in each of the next three. So that will be your increase for round five. But again, it's just more single crochets and you can follow along with the written pattern as well for that, especially now that you've seen how these work a little bit. So I just want to check and make sure I'm doing this right here. We've got one, two, one, one, two, one, one, two, one, one, two, one, one. And that should have been two. So let me pull that one out and get two in the previous one there. So I just want to get through this fourth round. And then I think what I'm going to do, since we're running low on time, is I'm going to go ahead and skip round five. I want to talk a little bit about that front loop back loop only. So while I finish up this row, Allison, was there anything else I could address? Um, there's a great question here. Uh, she wants to just make the basket part and use them for Easter baskets. Oh, fun. Do you have any suggestions on how to make a handle? Absolutely. Um, I have a great tutorial on my YouTube channel um, about making bag handles. And I think that's about what it's titled is bag handles. Um, Basically, what I recommend is that you decide how wide you want your handle to be, you know, like how many how many stitches would it take to be able to fit your fingers in there and then mark out on your basket using these stitch markers, mark out on the basket where you think you might like those handles to be and then count the number of stitches in between. Make sure those are even and you're all set. So then when you go ahead and make those handles, you can just basically chain however long you want the handle to be, skip over however many stitches are needed to get your hand in there and then pick up again on the other side with that next stitch marker. So that is the, the talky version of it. But like I said, I do have a video tutorial for that if you wanted to check that out on the Moogly YouTube channel. Um, if we have time here at the end, I'd be happy to pull up the finished basket and sort of point out what I mean on a full size basket as well. But uh, yeah, adding handles. And then I always recommend too, you know, you might wanna go around it again. Um, make the handle a little thicker and sticker, stiffer itself. Um, but that's totally up to you. You can make long handles that way, short handles. Um, but using the stitch markers to plot those out is really a huge, huge help. One, two, one, okay. So that would be two. And one, and one. Yeah, I, uh, sorry, you have to, once in a while you have to concentrate and count your stitches, but, uh, I am a huge, huge proponent of stitch markers. Um, whatever brand, whatever style, whether you're using actual stitch markers, you could use um, in a pinch, you know, you can use paper clips. Um, when I was learning how to crochet, I was just using small scraps of yarn. Um, although there's some downfalls to those as well. I kept losing them, they kept falling out. But, you know, in a pinch, you can definitely use other things. They're just so handy to help you keep track. Um, you know, you, you don't have to use them, but uh, they save a lot of headaches in the long run. So like I say, this is round four. Again, we can sort of count our circles here. We've got one, two, three, four. So we know we're finished with round four and round five is more of the same. We're just increasing again in another flat circle. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna pretend that we've got 50 stitches here, even though we've only got 40. And I'm gonna go ahead and jump to the instructions for round six. Now round six is the last time we're gonna chain one. 
but at the end, we're not going to join. We're also going to be working in the back loops only. So I'm gonna move this over here for a minute and bring this real close to the camera so we can take a real good look. I think I'm gonna go ahead and pull that loop up out there. All right, so here we have the top of a single crochet stitch. There's the front and here's the top. And you can see, if I hold it this way, how they sort of make little Vs that are nested into each other. It's a little harder to see with this fuzzy yarn, but normally when we crochet, we go under both of those loops, right? When we talk about front loop only and back loop only, that's when we separate them. The one closest to you, the crocheter, the one that my hook's under right now, is the one that, that's the front loop only. The one that's furthest away from you, that my hook's under now, is the back loop only. Now, if I flip this over, so that the stitch is now facing the other direction, this one's the front loop only. It's still the one that's closest to me. So front loop only and back loop only are always relative to you, the crocheter. It's what direction you're looking for at it from. It's sort of like right and left. It's not inherent to the project itself. Now I wanna point out when you go under, unless it otherwise says, when you go under those front loop only or back loop only, you still do it in the same direction from front to back. So when we crochet in the back loop only for round six, we're gonna go in in the middle of the stitch and come out under just that back loop only. We don't wanna try and come from the back of the stitch and end up in the middle. We wanna start in the middle and end up in the back. So let's go ahead and get that loop back on our hook there and pull that down to size. And now I'm gonna go ahead and get that stitch marker out of there because getting into the back loop only, it is definitely going to be in the way. So this is the stitch right there that I joined to. And getting into that first one can definitely be the trickiest one. You just have to sort of push your hook right into the center of that stitch there until you can feel it pop out the back under that back loop only. And then of course you can make your single crochet. I'm going to go ahead and mark that stitch as well because it's gonna be particularly important now that we are working in a spiral. When you're working in a spiral, I was talking about this a little earlier, you always want to mark the first stitch of every round. Otherwise it becomes incredibly easy to lose track of where you are in the pattern. So we've got that first one made. So let's go to the next stitch. I'm gonna put our hook right in the middle of that stitch there under just that back loop only and make another single crochet. And in round six, we're working even. We're not increasing at all. So that means we're working one single crochet in each, oops, sorry about that. There we are, bump my little cord there. We're working one single crochet in each single crochet around. Bring that back into camera there. So we go right into the middle of the stitch, out the back, pull up our loop and make our single crochet. So a couple of things are gonna happen here as we're making this round. Because we're not increasing anymore, we're going to be creating the sides of our basket. We're coming up and it's going to start pulling in because we're not gonna be working flat. There won't be any increases. Also, you can see right here, that little ridge there, those unused front loops that we didn't work into, those are gonna create a really great little line that helps our basket sit nicely and neatly on the table. This is a trick that I have used in a lot of baskets I've made, not all of them, but a lot of them. And I do love it. It just creates a really nice flat bottom for the basket. So like I say, round six isn't difficult. It's more single crochets. We're not even increasing, but the real trick until we get to the end is just a crochet under those back loops only. So I'll pull up some more yarn here. Allison, were there any questions about the back loop only or? Uh, no questions here. Okay, awesome. Well, it's a lot of stitches. <laughs> like I say, this is why we can't make the whole basket in an hour, but um, we'll continue to work our way around here. And then I wanna sort of uh, take a look at the rest of the basket pattern together. Actually, I just glanced at the time and realized we only have five minutes left. So instead, I'm gonna show you there, that's what it should look like at the beginning at least, and from the side after your sixth round. But when we get to the end, I am going to, for the sake of time, pull this round out here, just so I can show how that works. Because I don't think we'll have time to get all the way back around for another round here. So I'm gonna pull this out and use this little swatch right here just to demo some more of these stitches. So let's pretend that 
This is the end of round six. We'll pretend I'd worked in the back loop only. And now I've come all the way around. This is that first stitch, which I should definitely have marked because I'm gonna be working in a spiral. And now instead of slip stitching to it, I'm just gonna go ahead and move on to the instructions for the next round. So for round seven, let me, that's when we go to the second page. I gotta change my page here. For round seven, it's again, just a single crochet in each stitch around. So rather than joining, we just go right into that first stitch and make a single crochet. So then we definitely wanna make sure that we move that stitch marker up to that new first stitch right away, because it's just going to create a really continuous smooth line all the way around. And so you won't have that little jog that's created by the turning chain to let you know when you've come to the end of a round. So that's why those stitch markers are so, so important. So if you don't have any, definitely grab a safety pin, a paper clip, anything that opens up um, that you can use to help you keep track of that very first stitch. But then we just keep going around and around and around. Now, let's pull back up that written pattern here for these last few minutes. All righty, so round eight, 10 have increases, just like we were doing in our flat circles, but there's just could be more stitches in between the increases so that it creates more of that gentle shape that creates a basket rather than being a flat circle. Some of these rounds we worked even, so just go ahead and follow that through. The slip stitch and the chain don't count as stitches, but now that we're doing in the spiral, we won't be doing either one, no slip stitching or chaining, just single crochets. So go ahead and follow those instructions as written. The other stitch though that I did wanna point out is once you get to round 15, you're gonna start decreasing. So let's look at that finished basket again. You can see how the sides draw in. To do that, we make decreases. And the decrease we use is a single crochet two together. So I wanted to make sure to demonstrate just what that looks like here. So I'm gonna pull up a little bit more yarn here so I don't have to pull out of my skein. So a single crochet two together is a decrease. We've been making increases up till now where we put two stitches in the same stitch so that we have more stitches in the next round. With decreasing, we're trying to turn two stitches into one stitch. So let's work a single crochet two together in the next two stitches. What we're going to do is I'm gonna find that next stitch actually right here. I'm gonna insert my hook and yarn over and pull up a loop just as I normally would for a single crochet. But then I'm going to go into the next stitch and yarn over and pull up a loop again. Now I have three stitches right there, or excuse me, three loops on my hook. So I'm going to yarn over and pull through all three of those. And now you can see we worked into two stitches, but when we look at that top V, we've made just one stitch. So that is a single crochet de decrease. So let me do that one more time. We're gonna go into the next stitch, pull up a loop, go into the next stitch after that, pull up a loop, and then yarn over and pull through two. So for the last few rounds of this pattern, instead of increasing every few stitches, we'll have decreases every few stitches to help pull those sides in. So let's go ahead and come back to me for the main camera. I'll go ahead and set that one aside. All right, and we can take one more look here at the finished basket. And you can see what I was talking about. We've got some gentle increasing here, then we work even for a few rounds, you know, single crochet in each single crochet. And then we just decrease a little bit up the sides. And you can see a little bit more here at the top. When you're working in a spiral, you're going to have a little bit of a jog there where you join because we aren't using that ladder. We're just working in a continuous spiral. It sort of has to taper off a little bit. So you can sew in your ends when you weave in your ends and sort of sew those into the next stitches to help that decline just a little bit more gently. So that is the really nice crochet basket. Uh, Allison, was there anything else I could answer real quick? I, oh, Diane had a question here. Okay. When you slip stitch to join mm -hmm. and the chain don't count as stitches, correct? Right. Yes. The okay. slip stitch does right. not count as a stitch. That's why you'll see when I was working in the round, um, I, without, with the joining, excuse me, with the joining and chaining one, I would put a stitch marker in that first and last stitch. That really helps me know where that row ends 
and begin so I don't accidentally work into that slip stitch. Um, you know, you'd never work into the slip stitch unless you're told to work into a slip stitch, basically, is kind of the rules of slip stitches. Um, you know, the more advanced you get in crochet, the fancier things can get. But generally speaking, the slip stitch is just there to join the end of the round. Um, and then there are just a couple of people who asked about row eight. Okay, let me take a look at row eight. I know we didn't get to that one. Um, let's see. Uh, sorry, just kind of reading it here live. Two, two. Yes, that's going to be a whole lot of increases, isn't it? A few people, um, they mentioned that they thought it would be too many. Let me see. We've got, okay. In round five, let's talk it through. In round five, we've got 50 stitches. Why working three single crochets in between each increase? That's right, because then, yes, five stitches. Um, so round eight, you're now working. Oh, you know what it is? It should be one single crochet into each of the next two stitches. That would be the error. So, yes, we found the error. Sorry. Sorry for the quiet there. I had to think it through for a minute and do the mental math. Um, yes. Read round eight as if you got your pen and you can make a little correction here. You'll want to be asterisk one single crochet in each of the next two single crochets, two single crochets in the next single crochet, then one single crochet in each of the next two. Then you'll have four single crochets in between each increase. And that would maintain that pattern that we've been working on up till then. So sorry, Allison, one more correction for the pattern. That's okay. <laughs> and for those of you who, um, the pattern corrections will be posted on yarnspirations.com. But of course, if you, um, if you check back there, that's where you should be able to get them. Yes. Um, and I did see a po question pop up about sewing the tail on the basket. Um, obviously we're kind of out of time here, but I'm going to hold it up to the camera really well. What I would recommend, and I didn't do this on my tail. I wish I had, I hadn't, didn't think of it at the moment. Um, but when you make that first slip knot, if you leave a nice, really long tail on that end, let me pull, <clears throat> excuse me, pull my little tail up here again. You can see here, if I had left these a lot longer, then that would have been great and really handy. They would have been ready, waiting right there for me to sew on to the whale itself. But as for the sewing, I would just recommend that you get a yarn needle with a nice big eye. Yarn needles come in different sizes. Um, so, you know, you need a bigger one for bigger yarns. And then basically go ahead and put those tail ends, even one at a time on the yarn needle. You don't have to use them both to sew on if you don't want to. And then just sort of line it up with one of your rows. Remember I was talking about those valleys in between the rows. If you line the tail up, right in one of those valleys that will help you keep it on really straight and then just use your needle to go right through the body of the basket and sew the tail on um i would say you know sort of a a whip stitching motion or just you know back and forth with the needle it doesn't have to be fancy um it's a really fuzzy yarn and if you're using the same color you know obviously these are two different colors i wouldn't want to sew this one on but if you're using the same color yarn to sew it on uh those stitches should pretty well disappear you can see it's just kind of stitched right directly sewn right on there um but yeah just about halfway up of course you can make it higher or lower whatever suits you whatever you like um but you can just use that tail to sew it on there or cut a new piece if you didn't think of it like i did and then too i'll go ahead and flip it over you can see that that uh, unused front loop only creates that really beautiful line there on the bottom of the basket as well but uh, yeah, I think officially we're over. So Michaels would probably let it, like to let us say goodbye. Um, I do want to point out this video is recorded though, of course. So you can always go back and watch it. And one thing I like to recommend, um, especially if you're a beginner, you know, you can use that little gear icon on YouTube to really slow down videos quite a bit or speed them up, um, you know, whatever you need. So in addition to pausing videos and going back and watching things, I know I have to do that a lot when I'm learning a new stitch, um, using that gear icon can be a really big help because you can really slow things down even more than I could even slow down my hands. So hopefully that will help you with this pattern as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tamara. And we're so, thank you everybody so much for joining us this evening. And I'm sure we'll see you all back at another community classroom soon. All right. Thanks so much. And thank you to Michaels for having me. Have a great day, everybody.